of the series? Am I the first one to present? Yeah, the second one. Okay, so so um, so I'm excited to learn with you today. I know that you've taken it upon yourself, many of you, to learn Kohelet. And as I said to Shoshana, Kohelet is actually a book um, that I haven't taught in the past. Um, and what I wanted to do with you is to do something slightly different. I wanted to take Kohelet, but to use it as a frame in order to understand a much bigger question. I actually think a question in many ways that Kohelet addresses over and over again. I would say the foundation of the book, the premise of the book, is based on the question that we're going to look at. Um, but I also think it's a question that in many ways meets us and has met us. And I guess we've all come face to face with over the last 10, 11 months. Um, and a question that in many ways lies at the heart of the thug of the festival in which we read Kohelet, um, which is Sukkot. And there's always been this question, what's the relationship between Kohelet and Sukkot? Why did, we, why did Chazal, why did the rabbi specifically marry these two, you know, this reading with this festival? Why are they together? And what I want to do with you is to go on a little bit of a journey tonight. I want us to begin thinking about a, a school of philosophy OK, don't don't uh, get too worried. I know it's eight o'clock at night. I'm not going to dig down very deep into philosophy, but I want us to kind of just think for a minute about a, a certain school of philosophy, which I'm going to talk about in a second. I want us to mull on the question of that school of philosophy. And then I want us to take it to the book of Kohelet. I believe and I've, I've said this all the time. I believe that the Torah, I believe the Tanakh is a book. It's not a book of law. It's, it is a book of law. Obviously, there's law in it, but it's not primarily a book of law and it's not primarily a book of theology. It's actually a book of life. And if you think about the word Torah itself, Torah means Torah. It means to teach. It's a way in which we learn about ourselves. It's a way in which we learn about our relationship to everything around us, our relationship to God, our relationship to the world, our relationship to ourselves, our relationship to family, our relationship to morality, to ethics to law, to religion. All of these things are addressed through the Torah. And there is a question that sits at the very heart of our humanity, and that is the question of life and death. In the last 11 months, we faced this in a visceral way. We faced, I'm sure many of us on this Zoom today know of, or unfortunately maybe are very close to someone who has passed away in the last 11 months in a tragic situation, a young person possibly. Many of us, some of us may even know people who are hostage. And many of us, even if we don't personally know these people, we're a second or a third circle away. There's very few people living in Israel today who are not at least a second or a third circle away from a tragic situation, from a tragic event. And therefore, this question comes face to face many times throughout our day, today more than ever. We woke up this morning, we asked ourselves the question, what is going to be in the next six hours? Are we going to be looking at mass casualties? Are we going to be looking at a situation in which we're living in our bomb shelters? We are facing this kind of sense of fragility on a day-to-day -day basis. And this question of fragility, this question of nothingness of being, which we're going to talk about in a second, the question of the impermanence of my existence, these are questions in which, these are questions that Kohele addresses. They, they lie at the very heart of the book of Ecclesiastes, the very heart of the book of Kohelet. And I want to begin by talking about a certain school of thought in philosophy, and that is called the existentialist school of thought. The existentialists who many of them were born and they, they came up they were also philosophers, but they were also, many of them were actually philosophers and literary um, um, writers. And many of them, um, many of them lived in Europe in a in the post-war period after the Second World War. And they were really facing a situation in which, you know, many of them were writing in Paris, and Paris at the time was basically destroyed. They were writing in the wake of a very tumultuous and in some senses um, visceral experience of suffering and they question the premise of philosophy until that point continental philosophy had spoken about the idea that we can understand our sense of being from abstract 
um, categories. We can put everything into abstract categories. We can place everything in boxes and we can know everything about who we are, what we are from these abstract categories. The existentialists turn around and they say no. It's not about the essence of a thing. It's about the existence of a thing. The essence of things tells me, you know, it's a mathematical equation in some sense. It tells me what that thing is made up of, but it doesn't tell me how that thing experiences the world around them. How do I feel? How do I look at the world around me? How do things come to me? What happens to me when I face certain events? That's existentialism on in a, on a shoestring, obviously very, very um, shorthand. And I want to begin today by reading something from a, a slightly unconventional source. It, this was a book I read a few months ago, a brilliant book if anyone's interested in an introduction to existentialist philosophy by someone called Sarah Bakewell. And it's called At the Existentialist Cafe. And she writes it's half um, autobiographical and half philosophy. She writes about the lives of the existentialists in the post-war, in post-war Paris. She speaks about Camus, Sartre. Um, she speaks about, um, uh, uh, um, it's gone out of my head now. Oh, it's going to come to me. Many different existentialist philosophers, Simone, Simone de Bois. She speaks about many different existentialist philosophers who are writing at that time. And the one thing that characterizes all of them is that they were all grappling with the question of existence. What does it mean to live? What does it mean to be a mortal being? What does it mean to be a human being? Now, we all know, if you think about existentialist philosophy, many people come to mind the very famous quotes by Jean-Paul Sartre, who says um, that um, he speaks about the idea, as uh, Camus, not Sartre, sorry, he speaks about the idea that um, the only logical question is whether I should commit suicide or not, right? That, that's the basic question. But I want to go a bit further back, and I want us to understand what's really you know, what's really at the heart of the existentialist question? Why is this important and how is it related to Coelette? Very simply, because way before the uh, late 1900s, when these philosophers were writing, there was a king called Shlomo Amelech who wrote a book called Coelette, which was the first book of existentialist philosophy. What he wrote in that book precedes any existentialist philosopher, and it is the exact same content. It's just the book of the Bible. So people don't call it existentialist philosophy, but it is. So I want to begin with Sarah Bakewell, and then we'll get to, um, to Kohelet. She speaks about Camus, and she says, in, in a way, she talks about Camus and how Camus wrote. And she says it was a very, on Heidegger, Heidegger is also very well, someone Heidegger was a very well known philosopher who they say was the father of existentialist philosophy. He speaks about the idea of the question of being. She says, for Camus, we must decide whether to give up or keep going. If we keep going, it must be the basis of accepting that there is no ultimate meaning to what we do. Camus concludes his book with the myth, he talks about in his book, The Myth of Sisyphus. And we'll talk about that in a second. And he, he at the end of all of it, he says, one must imagine Sisyphus happy. What is the myth? The myth is that the gods wanted to punish this person, Sisyphus. And how do they punish him? They punish him by making him roll a boulder up a hill, up a mountain. And as soon as he gets to the top, it rolls back down. And this is his fated existence for the rest of, for, for eternity. He rolls the boulder up and down. And what Camus says is that the moment Sisyphus reaches a sense of happiness is the moment he accepts the meaningless of his life, the meaninglessness of his life. He accepts the absurdity of his existence. Only then can he be happy. Now, this is all very depressing, but the book you're learning is very depressing. And I want to tap in and I want to ask the question, where can we find happiness? Is happiness everything? It seems to me that Kohela is telling us happiness may, may be the be all and end all. How do we achieve it? How do we achieve happiness? Is happiness everything? It, 
How does Sisyphus achieve happiness when he knows there's meaninglessness in the universe? When he knows that life is essentially absurd, how does he achieve meaning? Listen to what she says. She says the main influence on Camus is not Heidegger, but Kierkegaard. Those of you that have heard of Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard was actually a religious. He was the first religious existentialist philosopher. And he wrote a very famous book on Akedat Yitzchak, on the sacrifice of Isaac called Fear and Trembling. And he says, for Ki she said, sorry, Sarah Bakewell, for Kierkegaard, the story shows that we must make this sort of impossible leap in order to continue with life after its flaws have been revealed. As he wrote, Abraham resigned everything infinitely, infinitely, and then took everything back on the strength of the absurd. This was what Camus thought his modern readers needed to do, but in his case, without any involvement of God. Here too, one can see connections to life in occupied France. Everything has been compromised, everything lost, yet there Yet that it all seems to it seems to be things people seem to be. It is the sense that has gone. How do you live without sense? The answer offered by Camus and Kierkegaard amounted to something like the motto in the British moral morale boosting poster: "Keep calm and carry on." Now I think today, especially today. We look around and I I sometimes just am amazed by Israelis. Right, they do just carry on. We do just carry on. But I think it's more than the British motto of the war, right? Keep calm and carry on. It's more than that. There's something in the Israeli psyche that, and by the way, even more now, we're going to see in a second, in almost every, there's something about the Israeli psyche that taps into a bigger story. And here I want to, I'm going to, in a minute, I'm going to bring in some research that's done on, Isra on Israeli society. But I want to think for a second about the show Hamilton. One of my favorite, favorite songs, favorite parts of the show Hamilton, for those of you that have seen it, is about Alexander Hamilton, one of the founding fathers of America, who wasn't all that well known until the musical, hit show musical came out. And in one of the last songs, his wife, after his death, talks about, she speaks about who lives, who dies, who tells your story. And this has been something that for me personally, I've been mulling over a lot over the last 10 months when we've seen the tragic death of so many young soldiers. And we've seen so many of their families and their friends trying in some sense to build their legacy, to allow their name to continue. And we have to ask this question, what is life about? What is our story? What is our legacy? What gives us happiness? How do we live our lives? How should we live our lives? And there's been this amazing research done. Many years, there's a, I don't know if anyone's seen it, there's a happiness um, chart on the happiest countries in the world. And Israel, almost every single time, comes near the top. I think this time it came third, near the top of the charts. And you have to ask this question. Right. I was recently in, in Switzerland and when I was walking around in Switzerland, you see it's never had war on its soil or if it has, it's many, many years ago. It's everything is calm. People are calm. And you think to yourself, how could anyone there actually understand that Israel and what it is to live with the constant threat of war, with the constant threat of enemy attacking? Why does Israel come so high up on the happiness scale? And I think that one of the answers is because happiness doesn't come from simple, simply living in a nihilistic way where we seek pleasure. Happiness comes from leading meaningful lives. And here I want to circle back for a second to Kohelet. What is Kohelet asking? First and foremost, I think Kohelet is asking us a very basic question, and that is exactly the question the existentialist asks question of the nothingness of being. We live, we die, the sun rises, the sun goes down. There's nothing new under the sun. What is the purpose in our existence? And there are a few responses to this. I want to share with you I'm going to skip number two. I, I, You should all have the source sheets. I put a lot of sources on. We're not necessarily going to get through all of them. 
they I specifically do it in order for you to afterwards take it, study it, learn it again, and um, you know, dig down deeper. So here's a, a, another very interesting um, article from the uh, a Journal of Positive Psychology that speaks about the difference between how one predicts happiness. And ultimately what it talks about is the idea that the, one of the key factors in leading a happy life is to lead a life of meaning. Jonathan Haidt, who is a brilliant American psychologist and public intellect, in his book, The Happiness Hypothesis, he also speaks about his own journey. And he also speaks, he, he, he is an atheist, even though he's Jewish, but he's an atheist. And he speaks about, he brings in a quote from Ecclesiastes from Kohelet. And there he speaks about the fact that at some point he went through what we would call, I guess, an existential crisis when he was in college. And he just said, like, all of a sudden I realized, what am I living for? You know, what is the point? Every Everything is pointless, this pervasive pointlessness. And he said, I finally escaped when after a week of thinking about suicide, I turned the problem inside out. There is no God, no externally given meaning to life. I thought so from one perspective, it really wouldn't matter if I kill myself tomorrow. Very well then, everything beyond tomorrow is a gift with no strings and no expectations. There is no test the hand in the end of life. And so there is no way to fail. This is really all there is. Why not embrace it rather than throw it away? And then he continues in his book to build up what happiness is. And he says, happiness comes from between. It comes from getting the right relationships between yourself and others, between yourself and your work, between yourself and something larger than yourself. And this is what I want to tap into. Now, I don't want to go down Jonathan Hyde's path. I, do, I don't know if that's the path Kohelet necessarily goes down, that I'm going to leave up to you when you study it to, to, to um, bring your own conclusions. Um, you may think that that is where Kohelet takes it. You may think that Kohelet in the end doesn't actually bring meaning in. Some people argue at the end of the book, he does. And some people argue, no, he doesn't. I'll leave that up to you in your sessions that you're learning. And I and again, I want to bring what Jonathan Haidt says here. He says here that there's something of happiness happens in the in-between, but he says it also is about the relationship between yourself and something larger than yourself. And I want to put that for a minute to the side, but I want it to be in our heads because we're going to come back to it. So this is the human dilemma. Jean-Paul Sartre says, nothingless lies coiled in the heart of the being like a worm. I exist and that is all and I find it nauseating, right? That in some senses kind of parallels what Jonathan Haidt was saying at the beginning. But now I really want to see it from Kohelet himself. Where do we see this existential philosophy come in the book itself? First and foremost, it begins Hevel Havalim. Now, Hevel Havalim has had many, many different translations over the years. Vanity, everything is vanity, not the best translation. Utter futility, this is one translation, probably nearer. Rabbi Sachs speaks about the idea of Hevel coming from the original Hevel, right? If you remember, who is Hevel? Hevel, we have Kayin, right? Where Chava calls him Kayin and says, Kaniti Isha Hashem, I have brought this man together with God. I have, you know, he, he is a Kinyan, he is a, 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 a partnership with God. And Hevel isn't even given a meaning to his name. There's something already in the name Hevel that is the nothingness. Rabbi Sachs translates it beautifully as a breath. Breath, a fleeting breath. But that describes what the author of Kohela here is saying. Hevel Hevalim, Amar Kohela. Hevel Hevalim, Akol Hevel. Everything is a fleeting breath. It's transitory. It's not permanent. It's the impermanence of being. That is the existential question. I know I am on this earth for a very short time. How do I make an impact? That question of my legacy, that question of what do I leave behind, that question of my existence, even if we don't face it, even if we in some senses repress it at some point, at different moments, that question rears its head and we come face to face to it with it. And I think today more than ever, when we open up every day the news and we hear of these young, beautiful kids, and they really are kids, right? That 
have lost their lives and we see how the youth and how their families are trying to keep their spirit alive, their names alive. And we ask this question, what is the purpose of our being? How do we keep the flame of a human being alive? What is the purpose of them being here on earth? Do not tell me that thousands of years before the myth of Sisyphus came into Camus' existentialist philosophy, it was already sitting here in the Tanakh. What is the purpose of the work that we do? The myth of Sisyphus, what Camus brings into his book, is this question, this metaphor for the meaningless of meaninglessness of life. We go to work, we come home, we continue on this kind of treadmill of existence. And what is the point under the sun? And that's exactly what the author of Kohelet is asking here. Do holech, the do ba. A generation comes, a generation goes, but the world continues to turn on its axis. The zarach hashemesh, uva hashemesh, for elma komosho ef zorech husham. The sun rises, the sun sets, and it keeps going back to where it came from. What, what is the purpose of our being? And he continues in other places. I spoke to my heart. It's true. I've become richer and I've added wisdom to the world. Right? And I saw before me so many things. I gave my heart over to, to becoming a uh, 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 wise and and full of information and full of knowledge and at the end of it i learned that this was just as as it might be called a um a a, a idea in the wind it comes and it comes and it goes and again, yes, Hebel Hashem Asal Aretz Hashem Yet Sadikim Hashem Magielahem Kmasa Aretz Rishaim. The Yesh Rishaim Shemagielahem Kmasa Aretz Sadikim Amati Shagam Ze Hevel. And all the frustration in the world, right? And we see the person who is righteous. And here we come to the problem of evil. Someone who is righteous, right? Um, um. Gets the reward of someone who is bad, and someone who is bad gets the rewards of someone who is good. And I realized, and I praised the joy that actually in the end, there's nothing good for man under the sun. Eat, drink, and be merry is not a modern expression. Its root, its source is exactly here in Kohelet. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you will die. This is its origin. And this is what Kohelet seems to suggest, that there is nothing specifically um, meaningful about our existence. And then he continues in source number eight. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he talks here about the idea that you should just go and enjoy the world, right? Go and enjoy women and enjoy clothes being washed and enjoy happiness and enjoy the fleeting days because that's all there is, because there is nothing else under the sun. So this is one response. One response is nihilism, which seems to be this kind of Maybe not even nihilism, maybe exactly what the existentialists say, accept the absurdity of existence and enjoy life. Now, the existentialists take it one step further. They say create meaning because ultimate happiness comes from meaning. Shlomo HaMelech, I'm not sure, certainly in the beginning of Kohele, doesn't say that. Shlomo HaMelech says here, in, it's a very kind of, uh, uh, it's a kind of nihilistic response to existence. There's nothing we can do. There's no meaning really in this world. We come and we go, generations come and go, our name will be forgotten, so just enjoy tomorrow. Erica Brown, uh, who wrote a book on Kohelet just recently, she writes, she kind of sums it up very beautifully and I wanna share with you what she writes. By the way, I forgot to mention, 
just coming again to see all your lovely faces. I forgot to mention that if anyone has a question, just raise your hand at the bottom. There is reactions, put your hand up. So even when I'm sharing screen, I can see that your hand is up. If it's a question that can wait until the end, I will leave time at the end for questions. Okay, so I just forgot to mention that. Came back to see all of you. I'm going to go back to the source sheet. Erica Brown says like this, looking back on a century of two world wars, nuclear disasters, the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, the tragedy of Rwanda, natural disasters, political polarization, anti-Semitism, racism and other hate crimes, harassment, terrorism, pandemic, and a daily onslaught of difficult news. And we would add, obviously, this was written, written before October the 7th. We need to obviously add that. And it is not hard to augment our personal disappointments with those of a world that seemed to let us down hour after hour. There is a breathlessness to it all. Many, I'm going to stop here. I'm just going to say many, many people that I have spoken to over the last 11 months the language that they speak to me in, and I'm detecting it because I guess I'm always thinking philosophy, but the language, the way in which they speak to me, the questions that they are asking, they're all existentialist questions. They're all questions that tap into the very question, the very basis, very foundation of Kohelet's writing. What is the point? What is the purpose? What is the meaning here? Are we part of something bigger? Are we not? What does my life mean within the matrix of my people? How does my short kind of individual life intersect with something much bigger? Listen to what Erica Brown says. Amid Kohelet's nihilistic opening that, that all is utterly futile, he proposes a question that will in various guises dominate the book. What profit is there for a person in all the labor he performs beneath the sun? This may be asked with a rhetorical flush, namely, if all is futile, then what value could there ever be to life? Alternatively, at a low moment when all seems futile and absurd, Kohelet nevertheless musters the reserve to ask a question about human purpose in earnest. What does it mean to lead a significant life? For some, significance is measured by a long and impressive list of personal accomplishments. For others, it's about making a difference in the life of others although what this difference is, is rarely defined. The wrestling described in Kohelet emerges as an att attenuated desire for life that permeates the book. Utter futility of its opening verses is bookended by the end of the life in the final chapter, and the dust returns to the ground, and it was, and the life breath returns to God who bestowed it, Utter futility, says Sir Kohelet, all is futile. It begins as it ends, but there is a different tone at the end. And as you go through the book and you learn it together, you're going to see how the tone changes. Again, I'm going to leave it up to you. You can all send me messages and let me know what you think. I'm going to leave it up to you and your interpretive schema to understand what perhaps where that pivot is, where that turn is for Kohelet. But listen to what Erica says, because I think it's so beautiful and profound. She says, ultimately, there's little we can do to quell the drumbeat of nihilism in our own minds, because we will, in Kohelet's words, return as dust to the ground. But this harsh reality only intensifies Kohelet's musings. Catastrophe will break us and also educate us. Experience that comes with age is Kohelet's teacher. Could Kohelet? The man who questioned the value of anything that lived after him and devalued the worth of books have ever imagined that his own ruminations will still be read and relevant today? Likely not. In an abject state of mind, it is hard to imagine creating anything of purpose. But Kohelet's words did indeed outlive him by millennia. For whom did Kohelet toil? He toiled for us that we may see our questions in his, that we may continue the search for meaning that he so painstakingly pursued, and I'll say expressed, and that we may find our own searchuous way in the world. I think that this is such a profound way of understanding the book. Because in a sense, what Erica is saying here, at least I'm interpreting what she's saying, but I think what she's saying here is brilliant. She is saying 
that Kohelet's question of the question of being, the question of what do we live for and what is the point of our being, the answer is in the book of Kohelet itself. The fact that I, in 2024, am reading a book of Kohelet, a book that identifies, that characterizes my own modern day personal ruminations, personal quandaries, personal existential angst, personal questions of permanence and impermanence in the world, human questions that span a millennium, that is Kohelet's legacy. That is the meaning that we give and we are able to bring to the world when we bring something to the world that allows, that is a panacea for somebody else centuries later. Because ultimately, if we think for a second, there is maybe no answer to the question of the existentialists that we know for certain. And perhaps there's not, not an answer for certain to the question of Kohelet. And the only way that we can provide comfort is by doing two things. Number one, by sitting with somebody and being with them in their existential angst and their existential quandaries and their, and their suffering. That's how we bring comfort, by identifying, by saying you're not alone. Kohelet, Shlomo HaMelech is saying to us, you are not alone. I, the person who had everything in the world, I also went through what you're going through. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is to say, look, if my words endured thousands of years and they're still reaching you today, there is meaning beyond the absurd. And I think that in itself is such a profoundly beautiful message. And now what I want to do with you is to go a bit further on our journey. We've addressed the question, the question of the nothingness of being, as Heidegger might put it, the question of absurdity, as Camus puts it, the question of the purpose of our life on earth, as Kohelet puts it. We've addressed the question. We've responded in one way, which might be nihilism. Okay, there's no purpose at all. What's the point? We just carry on. And we roll the boulder up the hill and let it roll back down and roll it up and let it roll back down. And we accept it's the way things are. But I want to suggest that Judaism actually answers us in a different way. And there's a reason why we read Kohelet and Sukkot. Sukkot, as we all know, is defined in the Torah Azman Simchatenu, the time of our rejoicing. Why specifically is Sukkot called the time of rejoicing? It's very, very strange. And I want to share with you something that Sherry Mandel, Sherry Mandel, for those of you that don't know, lost her son many, many years ago in the most horrific um, terror incident. He was a young, I think he was 14. He was... Um, in, they were living at the time in the Gush area and he went, you know, one day he skipped school with a friend and they were basically um, bludgeoned to death by Palestinian terrorists in the fields. And she set up the most incredible organization, the Kobe Mandel Foundation, and she's written two books. And I want to share with you what she writes, because I think it's so profound and so beautiful. And it segues for us into our next part. And this is another response I want to bring. And that is the response of joy that comes specifically through the fragility and the impermanence of our being. Listen to how she frames it. She says it like this. We who have suffered and grown and flourished may experience a surprising sense of joy. If you were to visit Camp Kobe, Kobe Mandel Foundation has camps for children of um, terror, uh, victims of terror and their families. You would see that when bereaved children are happy, their joy is even greater than that of other children. In transcending our pain, in converting it into a mission, a destiny, we have experienced a tremendous breakthrough. We do not deny sadness, it will always be present. Yet our sense of joy expands. We experience joy not only in our expansions, but in realizing the true nature of existence. One of the happiest holidays in Judaism, Sukkot, is a time of joy where we recognize our own vulnerability. Sukkot teaches that our dwelling on this earth is temporary and insecure. 
When we live outside, we live not only our comforts, but our feelings of permanence. We can't lock our sukkah and we're vulnerable to the sun and the rain and the winds and the animals. There is a great joy in being in a sukkah. We are out of our routine, out of our homes, exposed in the Zohar. The sukkah is referred to as the shadow of faith. Those of us who have dwelt in loss know that we are vulnerable, but we are also privileged to comprehend our true human condition, our humility and our impermanence. And I want to share here something about Israel. I remember many, many years ago, just before I made Aliyah, I read the most amazing article by Daniel Gordis. And he spoke about the fact that, um, you know, someone asked him, why do you continue living in Israel? Why do you bring your kids up there? It's hopeless. There's wars. You know, why would you be there? And he wrote this most incredible response. And he basically said, because my kids believe in this, in the, in the future of their people, because they want to be part of the story. It was a beautiful response. And it really made me think about the nature of the land of Israel itself. If we think for a second, why does God take Abraham to, why does Abraham choose Canaan? Why is Canaan the choice for the people of Israel? precisely because there we are vulnerable. We don't have the Nile. We don't have a source of water in the ancient world. This was, you're not going to the peak of civilization. You're actually moving away from civilization. You're moving towards a place in which we have to have our eyes up to heaven. We have to be dependent and reliant on God. Fast forward thousands of years today, we are in exactly the same situation. We may have solved the water problem, but we are still constantly and permanently in a state of vulnerability. And yet, Israel always reaches the top in the happiness counter. And the question is why? And I've seen it, and I, I, many of you I'm sure have seen it too. There is something about the fact that joy born in the knowledge of the fragility of life is a much deeper and a much more profound joy. And I and 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 happiness, the happiness of knowing that you're part of something that, yes, you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And yes, you are surrounded by enemies, but there's a sense of purpose. And this is I want to show you now how Sukkot is described in the Torah. You're going to take these, these, the, the, all the Arba Minim and you're going to be happy before God. And all of you going to have to sit in these temporary residences. Why do you sit there? You sit there because you know, you, so you should know God took you out of Egypt. Now, what are these Sukkot? What do they have to be? So there is a massive debate, and I only bought you a very small part of it. There's a big, big debate in the Gemara, in the Talmud, about what makes a Sukkah kasher and not kasher. And the answer is very simply, whether or not it is defined as a permanent residence, keva, as a, pl a place of permanence, or arai, as a place of temporary residence. And every single time they debate it, they're asking this question, is it temporary or is it permanent? And this exactly is the heart of what we're talking about. What does it mean to find joy in temporary, in a temporary existence? That's the question the existentialist asks. We are here, it's the question Kohele asks, we are here for a short stay. We know that ultimately dust we will return to. And in this temporary existence in which we live, can we still find joy? Can we still create meaning? Can we still be part of something bigger than our own individual nihilistic existence? Rabbi Alan Liu, in his book, This Is Real and You're Completely Unprepared, he says like this, no building of wood or stone can ever afford us protection from the disorder that is always lurking around us. In the Sukkah, a house that is open to the world, a house that freely acknowledges that it cannot be the basis of our security, we let go of this need. This illusion of protection falls away and suddenly we are flushed with our life, feeling alive, following alive, doing its dance one step after 
another. I'm going to leave the rest behind for, for the sake of time. You can read it in your own time. It's very, very beautiful. And it really taps into this idea of what does it ha- what is happiness? What is joy? What is sman simchatenu? What does it mean to be joyful and to be happy? And I think one of the reasons Sukkot is called that is precisely because we acknowledge the temporary, the absurdity even, but the temporariness of our existence. We acknowledge as we step into the sukkah, we acknowledge that the sukkah represents our relationship with ourselves, with others, with God, with the world, with our very existence. And as we sit in the sukkah, in that temporary residence that we've created, that's the place we bring joy into the world. Precisely in that moment, of the nothingness of being. And that is acknowledging the existentialist dilemma, acknowledging Kohelet dilemma and saying, despite all of that, I affirm that even in the temporariness of my existence, I affirm meaning and I affirm joy. Any of you know Brene Brown, she's a a very well-known psychologist and a very well-known kind of public psychologist in America. Um, And she's written some, she's got got brilliant TED Talks, which I highly recommend. But she's also written some really beautiful books. And I just bought something from two of her books because she spent years and years researching vulnerability. That was her area of research, the idea of vulnerability. One of the things that she discovers is that the only way authentic, true connection happens, real connection, happens between two people is when they allow themselves to be vulnerable with each other. And as I was reading her and as I listened to her, I kept thinking about our relationship with God, with Hashem. Very often, part of human nature is that we want to create um, stability, certainty, modes of existence that allow us to function on a day-to-day basis. Order. Jordan Peterson calls it chaos and order, right? We we like to form, you know, various boxes, uh, cognitive boxes, and in our own routine, in our lives, order that allows us to function. All of us need that. But actually... If we dig down deep, we'll notice that the moments of real connection, the moments when we feel alive, the moments in which we are creative are actually the moments in which we step out of those maybe imagined imagined certainties, imagined order, imagined habits of routine. When we step out of those, it allows us to acknowledge our vulnerability acknowledge our impermanence, acknowledge the fact that there is a sense of absurdity in our existence and yet affirm the fact that despite all of that, we want to have meaning and connection. Listen to how she writes about it. It's really, really beautiful because I think this also taps in to a little bit about this idea of connection. What creates meaning, and if we think for a minute, about why Israel comes top very often on these charts, on these research things, is because Israel is still one of those places in the Western world that nurtures connection, where family is still super important, connection to others, social connections, religious connections, the individual, the radical individuals that permeates Western democracies, even though there are elements of it we see in Israel, it hasn't totally taken over. Um, Sharon or Larry, someone raised their hands. Yes, this is Sharon. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, I was curious, and I raised it here, because of the word grace, which we think of as a Christian concept, Uh, but you included it in this quote, and I'd like you to add how that concept may have uh, been significant to Brene Brown. 
Okay, so let me read Brene Brown and then we'll talk about it, okay? It's definitely a very Christian concept, the idea of grace, which is why we sometimes eschew it. But the truth is, I don't think it's such a Christian. Where does Christianity get it from? Christianity gets it from the Tanakh. And I don't think that it's such a, you know, um, non-Jewish concept. But let's read Brene Brown. To love someone fiercely, to believe in something with your whole heart, to celebrate a fleeting moment in time, to fully engage in a life that doesn't come with guarantees. These are risks that involve vulnerability and often pain. But I'm learning that recognizing and leaning into the discomfort of vulnerability teaches us how to live with joy, gratitude, and grace. What does she mean by grace? So she means it both from the perspective of grace to yourself forgiving yourself and also forgiving the other because vulnerability means that I open myself up to many different things. I open myself up to betrayal and I open myself up to pain and discomfort and I open myself up to recognizing parts of both myself and the other that I don't necessarily like but it also allows me to connect with the other on a very, very deep level. And when that happens, there has to be grace. There has to be grace. Grace essentially is the idea of forgiveness. And there has to be grace because you cannot have a relationship where there is no one, there is no um, uh, error. Okay, there's no relationship without error doesn't exist. At least not, I've never met anyone who has a relationship with the other person hasn't at one point done something wrong or wronged the other person in a certain way. And therefore, grace has to exist within the notion of vulnerability. OK, I, I hope I've explained it. I want to read the Atlas of the Heart. We need happy moments and happiness in our lives. However, I'm growing more convinced that the pursuit of happiness may get in the way of deeper, more meaningful experiences like joy and gratitude. What, what is she saying, Brene Brown? She's saying that in American society today, everyone talks about happiness, happiness, happiness. The truth is that their definition of happiness is wrong because their definition of happiness is this fleeting happiness that Kohelet speaks about. The pleasures of life, which obviously can make us happy for a minute or two when we go shopping and we come home with the full shopping bags and we try on our new dresses and we had that fleeting moment of pleasure. It may last a day, it may last a week, it may last a few weeks, but it's not sustainable. True joy, by the way, in Judaism, we have a special word for it, I think, the word nachat. Nachat, we talk very often about the idea of nachas, right? Jewish nachas, nachas, talk about it for, in terms of our children. But actually, it's not just about our children. It's really this idea of you have this, it's this very, very deep feeling of something that's giving you pleasure because you've sustained or you've nurtured something for a very, very long time. That's what nachas is. That is joy as Brene Brown describes it. Okay. I know from the research and my experiences that when it comes to parenting, what makes children happy in the moment is not always what leads them to developing deeper joy, rounded confidence, and meaningful connection. And this is where um I'm gonna skip Matt Haig. He's absolutely brilliant, but 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 he talked, he in his book, Reasons Stay Alive, which is basically an autobiographical book about his experience of depression. And he essentially talks about the idea of the shedding of the self, the shedding of the self, the shedding of the I, and the reach outwards. This notion, again, this notion of connection. And look what we hear about when we talk about the Sukkot. The, the festival of Sukkot should be seven days when you draw in, when you gather in all everything that you have on your threshing floor. And on that chag, you are going to the samachta bechagecha, you are going to rejoice. But not just you alone. You are going to rejoice with your son and your daughter and your male and female servant and the Levite and the stranger and the fathers and the widow. All of these people that are within your gates, that is who you're going to rejoice with. This is not radical individualism. This is not hedonistic pleasure. This is not nihilism. 
this is classically the response to Kohelet. The response to Kohelet is Chag HaSukot. Chag HaSukot, the time where we affirm the impermanence of our being, is the time when we take all the crops that we've nurtured and we share them with those who don't have. And that is when you are going to be happy. For seven days, you will have this festival in the place that Hashem is going to tell you, and you will bless all of your crops and all, everything that you've done, everything you've done with your hands, and you will be joyous. Why will you be joyous? Because you have shown gratitude. You've blessed God, not just you. It's not just I that did this, but God. Oh, we just read, literally, in the um, parasha that we just read, right? Right? So easy, we're going to come to the land, all of a sudden we're going to be, we're going to have these houses and these vineyards, and, the, and we're going to say, I did it all myself. No. Chaka Sukkot teaches us that we have gratitude, that it's not just us, that there's a partnership here, that it's God and it's me together. And once I've shown gratitude and I bless God for that, then I take everything I have and I share it. Because that sharing is where happiness is. Shoshana, I actually didn't ask you how long I have. Is it an hour? It's pretty big. Yeah. Okay, yes. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna take a, like five minutes extra, if that's okay, because I also want to leave a bit of time for for questions. We're not going to read today, David Brooks, but I highly recommend reading it. David Brooks, also very well known public intellect in America um, and a journalist. He has two amazing books. One is called The Road to Character. He's got a few books, but one is called The Road to Character and one is called The Second Mountain. And in both of those books, he speaks about traje life trajectories. And he speaks about the fact that very often we begin our life trajectory by pursuing pleasures, pursuing our career and pursuing the I kind of mentality but eventually we reach a certain point and we suddenly recognize that that has not given us what we want and he calls this kept climbing the second mountain and the second mountain is less about what I want from life and more about what I give it's less about what success I have for my resume and more about the things that I do that they will say in my eulogy that is ultimately the meaning of life and I I, I bought for you a quote from um the road to character, which I really recommend everyone read in their own time. I think not just about the idea of sharing, because that, of course, is important. But it's also about the question that we spoke about right at the beginning, the question of being aligned with something bigger than oneself. If we think for a second, and here Rabbi Sachs really talks to us, and he tells us, he when he writes about Kohelet, he says, if you look, the word ani, I, comes up 29 times in the book of Kohelet. The first person, Dibati Elibi, Anira Iti, comes up 117 times. Rabbi Sachs says that the author of the book is focused on the I and the antidote to the nihilistic way in which he sees the world, the existential angst that leads to suicide, if we're using the language of Camus, what's the remedy? There's only one remedy, and that is to see beyond the eye, to move from the selfie outwards, right? To say, to see, to understand that meaning is created in the vulnerability of connection. That meaning is created in shared joy. That meaning is created when I see beyond the eye. And what does that mean? It doesn't just mean personal connections, and it doesn't just mean family, and it doesn't just mean children. It also means being connected to my past, to my legacy, to my tradition, to something that came before me. 
And Rabbi Sachs beautifully in his book, Radical Then Radical Now, he speaks about the idea of us all being a letter in the scroll, that we belong to people. He talks about his experience in, 19, in 1967 when he was in Cambridge University and how all these unaffiliated Jews, and we saw that also on October 7th, came out the woodwork. Again, I'll leave you to read it on your own time, but just I'm going to literally just read the last part. He says, we're all letters in the scroll. I am a Jew because knowing the story of my people, I heard they're called to write the next chapter. I did not come from nowhere. I have a past. And if any past commands anyone, this past commands me. I am a Jew, because only if I remain a Jew will the story of a hundred generations live on in me. I continue their journey, because having come this far, I may not let it and them fail. I cannot be the missing letter in the scroll. I can give no simpler answer, nor do I know the more powerful one. We are letters in a scroll. Sometimes when we think about our lives, we think we're, you know, atoms floating in the universe. No, we're part of something bigger. Exactly as Erica said about the idea of Kohelet himself, of Shlomo Hamelech's words, being read in 2024 to help us as a remedy to what we're feeling post-October the 7th. That's profound. Why? because he's a letter in the scroll and we are letters in that scroll and we have a purpose and we have a job and we have a role. If we look, what's absolutely beautiful is that in the period when the um, prophets came back before the second temple was rebuilt, Nehemiah and Ezra, Ezra and all the prophets that came back, what they did, one of the first Chagim that they celebrated, in fact, the first hug they celebrated, because many of the people had assimilated, that was still, there was a group of people that remained in Jerusalem, remained in Israel, whilst everyone went into exile, and they came back to Israel, and a lot of these people had forgotten their tradition, forgotten where they came from, had become assimilated, and the first festival they celebrate is Sukkot, and I don't believe it's by chance. There's something about Sukkot that connects us to the bigger picture, that tells us that the very basis, the very foundation of Judaism, the very foundation of the lands of Israel, is to acknowledge the fragility of our existence, the impermanence of our existence, the vulnerability of our people in a land that is dependent on God, both for water and to protect them, to acknowledge those things, and at the same time to rejoice, to be joyful, to have faith. What is faith? Faith it's not the belief that everything's going to be okay. No, that's what Rabbi Sachs says. It's not that belief. It's the belief that together we will make it okay, that there is a God above and there is a human on earth and that we have both a vertical and a horizontal connection, a, 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 a horizontal connection to God above. He is part, we are part of a covenant. We work with him, but there's also a vertical connection to the people around us. And those connections, even in their vulnerabilities, those connections are what creates the joy, the sukkah above me, clouds, that horizontal relationship that we have with above connects me with the people that I sit around my table. I'm going to skip Michael Fishbane. He writes brilliantly about the idea of the shared tradition of Torah Shabbat of the written law, the oral law and the written law, and how we build on it in each generation. That is a matrix of shared meaning. That in itself, when we learn Torah, when we engage in the oral law, when we bring Chidoshim, new ideas into the world through Torah, we are engaging in a shared connection of meaning. And I finish with one of the most, I think, one of the most, my favorite narratives in the Torah, most beautiful narratives in the Torah, which forms actually the main part of Lel HaSeder, of the Haggadah, and that is um, the Bikurim ceremony. When we bring the first fruits up to the Bet Hamikdash, we have to, we work the land, we've come into the land, we've worked the land, and we bring them up to the Kohen Gadol, and we stand before him, and we bring them to him in this basket, and we make a statement, and we say, Armi Obed Avi, my father was a wandering Armenian. That's the statement, by the way, that forms the most of the Haggadah. And then we turn around and we talk about the history. We talk about where we come from. We say well, our people were enslaved in Egypt and they called out to God and they were um, and God came down and he saved them with miracles and he brought them to this incredible place, Eretz of Akalavudvash, this land of milk and honey. And then this is to me the most emotive part, and then this little farmer 
probably from the north or the south, who's spent weeks and weeks bringing up his first fruits to the temple. And now he says to the Kohen Gadol, to the, to the high priest, I have bought my first fruits from the land. And I put them now before God and I bow down to God. And the Torah tells us, and then, only then, can he be happy? Can he rejoice in everything that God has given him? And what more? You need to share that with the girl, the Levi, the stranger that within your midst. Where is joy? Once again, joy is in my story. Joy is in knowing that I, the farmer, have worked together with God to bring this fruit and I've taken it up and I have made a statement that I am a letter in the scroll. I stand before you and I say that I am the farmer here today, part of this people, that there's something much bigger than me. There's something much larger than me. And that is where my joy is. That is what gives us meaning. And I'm going to steal two more minutes of your time. I don't, I, I'm sure some of you who have been my students over the years have heard this, but I want to read it with you. Because um, someone called Zev Magen, who's a professor in Barilan University, a professor of Arabic studies, brilliant guy, hilarious guy. And he uh, wrote a brilliant book called Imagine John Lennon and the Jews, a philosophical rampage. Very much recommend the book. Quite easy reading, quite hilarious reading. But there's one point in the book where he talks about why he's a Jew and what it means. And in my mind, he doesn't say this, but in my mind, what he's doing in this narrative is he is setting out, he is making a modern day Bikurim statement. A modern day statement of, I am bringing my Bikurim and I am telling you why it's meaningful for me why being a Jew gives me so much meaning and so much happiness. And he says like this, if you reach out and grasp your people's hands, you were there. You participate in what they did in all those places and all those times. You fought their battles, felt their feelings, learned their lessons. You tended to the flocks of Rudrachel and slayed in Potiphar's house with Joseph. You sang in the wilderness with Miriam and toppled the walls of Jericho with Joshua. You carried the first fruits to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem were mesmerized by Elijah on the slopes of Carmel. You brought the house down in the Philistines with Samson, bewailed your virginity on the mountains with Yiftach's daughter. You fought the chariots of Chatzah and Devar and danced before the ascending ark with David. You went into exile with the prophet Jeremiah and hung your harp and wept by the rivers of Babylon. You defied the divinity of Nebuchadnezzar with Daniel. You vanquished the might of Persia with Esther. You sought communion with the infinite uh, with Shimon bar Yochai and studied law and law in the vineyards of Yavne with Elazar ben Arach. And you were with Yehuda Makmi and Modian and the zealots at Masada with Akiva in the Roman torture chamber and with Bar Kocha at Beitar. You devoted your life to Torah at Surah and Pombadita and philosophized by the Nile in full start with the circle of Maimonides, you were crucified for refusing the cross and the crusades and were turned into ashes for your stubbornness at the Auto de Fa. You were exiled from the shores of Spain by Isabella and chased down and raped by the hordes of, of Trimelenki. You went out to Svartsfield, Svartsfield to greet the Sabbath bride with Luria and went to the Galatia's hat, Galatia's hat, Galatia's hat to seek the ecstasy of the fervent Baal Shem Tov. You fled the black hundreds across Russia's tiger and were welcomed by Lazarus at the gates of Ellis Island. You filled into gas chambers at Bergen-Belsen and were hurled living to the flames at Matthausen, Sobibor, and Be'eri. You parachuted into Hungary with Khanna Senesh and fought back at Warsaw with Mordechai and Ilowitz. And you were shot with your family in the forests of Poland and dug a mass grave and perished at Babiyar. You revived your dead language. You resurrected your sap strength. You returned to yourself and renewed the lapsed covenant. You arose like a lion and hewed out your freedom on the plains and the mountains of your old new land. I am a Jew and I'm tied to teleolo teleology as well as history. I love, I live not just for today and not even just for all that has led up today. I also live for a thousand tomorrows. I do not know what will be in 10 centuries for now, for now, but I know that Jews will be. How do I know? Because I will work for it, because I will see to it. And I believe in myself as much as I believe in my people. Yes, Jews, there will be, and through them I will be, and through them I will touch what will be, and through them I will create what will be. You and I are members of a unique extended family. 
extend it in time as well as in space, extend it into the future as well as into the past. You partake in a 4,000-year-long journey of savage struggle and jubilant exhalation of unimaginable sacrifice and ineffable beauty, an adventure recently rekindled in a phoenix-like flash of incandescent splendor, the lights of which human history has never seen. And eventually you burn, my brother and sister, you burn with the light and the fever and the strength and the passion of the magnificent and undying people of Israel, the bush that burns and is never consumed. I think that what he says here connects to everything that we've said. And I finish with Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was himself a form of an existentialist. Viktor Frankl wasn't a believing Jew, but he left us an unbelievably important legacy. And that is the legacy of meaning. What Viktor Frankl saw in the death camps was that the person who survived was the person who tapped into a meaning larger than themselves. I finished with him. For success like happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue. And it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's personal dedication to a cause, cause greater than oneself, or is the byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. Happiness must happen, and the same holds for success. You have to let it happen by not caring about it. I want you to listen to what your conscious commands you to do and to carry, carry it out to the best of your knowledge. Then you will live to see that in the long run, in the long run, I say, success will follow you precisely because you have forgotten to think about it. And I'd say the same with happiness and meaning. We began by looking at the existentialist philosophy of Camus and Sartre, beginning with Heidegger, and we spoke about the idea of Kierkegaard as a religious philosopher. And we spoke about this notion of the banality of being, the idea that perhaps, you know, as Kohelet says, the sun revolves, nothing changes, one generation comes, one generation le leaves. And maybe all that we really should be doing is pursuing pleasure, is being, you know, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow, you will die. But Kohelet, Perhaps the reason we see this in Kohelet is because Kohelet has turned inwards. He has focused on the I, on the self. And maybe the panacea to that malaise is to turn outwards. Maybe really the answer to the question of meaning, the answer to the question of happiness, the answer to the question of Kohelet, which is the absurdity of life, to the question of the existentialist philosophers, which is the nothingness of being, it's precisely the answer that Kohelet brings in a roundabout way. And that is that you create, that you tap in to the story that you are part of, to the legacy that you inherit, to the tradition, to the shalshelet, to the, to the long chain of tradition that you are part of, and you are letter in that scroll. You need to seek meaning in connection, in vulnerability, in affirming that vulnerability and rising above it and knowing that there is a permanence to our being that continues even after we are no longer alive. And that permanence is the way in which we give to others, the way in which we transcend the self, and the way in which we bring or we connect to the legacy of something much bigger and much longer lasting and much eternal, much more eternal than just the I just the self. So with that, I finish. And by the way, that obviously connects in with Sukkot and joy and the, and the temporar temporariness, temporariness, I don't know what the word is, for of the Sukkot. Um, so with that, I open up to any questions that anyone has. My name is Hazel Rolf, and I'm living in Italia. And um, your presentation this evening was Unbelievably excellent. I, I'm an elderly person. I'm in my 80s. And my question is, and in what uh, age group would you say that Solomon wrote this? He must have had experience so it, of... Do you understand he what I'm trying to say to you? that? I, I mean, I hope I live a bit longer, but what I'm saying is that my life has to revolve around things which happened to 
we don't always have the time to um, bring out what you want to bring out or even think that you want. How old would, would you have any idea or how old you would have been? So there's a debate when it was written. Some people argue it was written when he was younger in his early life and other people argue no it was written at the end of his life and I I think that the debate in itself is actually a kind of a statement because in many ways those that say it was written in his early life are kind of saying well you know hold on he hasn't lived life fully and maybe he doesn't really understand um you know that how the trajectory of life affects and, and changes our views those that say he le led you know he wrote it in his late life are saying, you know, the older we get, the more we realize that maybe life really is meaningless. And then the question becomes, how do we, you know, how do we address that question? So there's an argument, there's no, there's no definite answer. No. Well, because he was so wise, I mean, he could have written it when he was much younger. I mean, he didn't live to be a very old age. Uh, Solomon. Question is, I mean, no one in those days lived to be that long, that old. But the question is, when he when he wrote it, was it towards the beginning, towards the end? I, I, no one knows for sure the answer. Um, Sharon, I think again. Thank you. Yes, uh, two things. One is, I think that he redefines life. Uh, no, I don't want the video. Uh, he redefines life um, as not uh, one life or one time of life one age in life, that life is the whole trajectory of human experience, and in our case of Jewish human experience. Secondly, I think it's significant in terms of all these amazing sources you've brought to us, including David Brooks, um, is that uh, Sukkot uh, comes after uh, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And the days in between those holidays, which give you opportunity to reflect on the cumulative force of each of them. And when they all come together in Sukkot and uh, Kohelet, uh, one is hopes to be more ready to read Kohelet the way you have taught us than we have in the years past. And yeah, I, think I think that's very much, yeah, I think, I think that's a very, very, much very important point. I think that's a very important point. Obviously, Sukkot comes at the after all of the, I would say, like introspective days of Elul and Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, whereby in a sense, we've gone through this kind of maybe even catharsis, but certainly introspection of self. The idea of the shvarim, of the trua, of the brokenness of our being, the fragility of our being, the idea where we come face to face with obviously all of the liturgy is centered around the idea of death and mortality. Um, and then once we have accepted, in some senses, in I would even say once we've kind of um, submitted ourselves, surrendered, I think would actually be the right word, surrendered ourselves to God, to the idea that really much of this is out of our control and some of it really is in, in our control. There's many things that we do have agency over, to to tefillah, tzedakah, but there's so much that we also don't. And once we've allowed ourselves to surrender ourselves to those thoughts, that notion of joy which is man simchatena, which is Sukkot, is that is actually then only then can we enter into that time period. So I think that's a very, very important point. Thank you for adding that. It's the concept of grace and forgiveness come into full ecstasy. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I, I remind you, I think Shoshana will send the source sheet. So again, please take time to look through them. There were sources we didn't manage to cover. Um, so you can definitely spend time. And uh, the other thing is that at the top of the source sheet is my website. You can go on my website, you can contact me. And I also have a weekly Torah WhatsApp, silent WhatsApp group. You can click on from the website if you want to join. Um, and that's all for now. Thank you very, very much for having me. Thank you.